when did you actually make the film and when did you finish the final cut? Uh, firstly, thanks for having me. I'm glad to be on as well. Um, regarding the bestowal, I started writing it in January of 2018. Um, so I think January, February, March. Yeah, I spent, I think, it was three months writing it. It was a full-time job. Um, I started getting fundraising for it, starting to get it off the ground around April, or is it, yeah, Mar around April, March, and I shot it at the end of May, beginning of June 2018, and post-production was three months, um, so then we, we had it ready around the end of September. Given what you know about independent filmmaking, that's pretty, pretty quick. Yeah, it's definitely on the shorter side. Um, I guess a lot of things sort of fell into place and we kind of just went with the momentum. Um, the shoot wasn't too long. Uh, we did quite a bit of rehearsals. Um, I had to make sure my actors understood, I guess, the themes of the film, um, what the intention was, um, like what we were trying to do with the film. If you're in an elevator, you meet someone you don't know in an elevator, they find out you're an independent filmmaker they say, oh, really? What have you made that I can see, and what's it about? What would you tell them, remembering that you've only got a few floors to go? Um, I'd probably point to two of my films. Just One Drink was a short film I made in uh, 2015 that I also wrote and acted in, and that did very well with critics and uh, got distribution on cable TV, and that's on my YouTube channel. And the other one is The Bestowal, uh, which is uh, on Amazon Prime and uh, a few other streaming platforms. The, the, so, yeah, the Bestowal, give us your elevator pitch. Okay, the guy says, The Bestowal sounds interesting. Tell me what that's about. But I've got to get off on the 35th floor and we're on 23. So give it your best, Andrew. So The Bestowal is a cerebral uh, sci-fi drama about a suicidal businessman who's visited by an interdimensional being, appearing in the form of a beautiful woman. And uh, Interstellar was a huge inspiration, um, visually, thematically. Uh, Christopher Nolan's my favorite all-time filmmaker, so um, I really love his cerebral style. But yeah, I guess it's a dialogue, it's a very dialogue-heavy film, tackles a lot of issues like capitalism, love, apathy, empathy, charity, poverty, and it's a very, uh, it's a film that I would consider polarizing. A lot of people love it. A lot of people really dislike it. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's kind of the uh, basic gist of it. Also, one of the big themes in the film is, I guess it's a classic theme about the value of material possession versus, I guess, spiritual fulfillment. Your film's premise is basically a guy who's about to kill himself despite the fact that he's rich and he has all the, I guess, all the uh, accomplishments of secular life uh, and is then um, visited by this being. Can you just tell me what inspired this take? Um, I'm holding back from pushing any religious reading onto you. Just tell me where the idea for this came from and then, Andrew, tell me what your intention is for the film, what purpose you want it to serve? Um, okay, so the idea was, um, yeah, so I guess living in LA, I've met a lot of uh, very, I guess, successful people, and, and I've realized that a lot of them aren't necessarily always happy. You know, you can have a lot of, a lot of things going for you from a professional level. I mean, everything could be, could be there. It's not. I'm not trying to say that money isn't important because money is very important. But the concept that money is the only thing that brings someone happiness in life, I think, is wrong. I think there's a lot more to life. You know, you have to be around people that like you. You have to love people. You have to sit, sort of be at peace. You can have a lot, a lot going for you materialistically, but if you're not at peace, then it's kind of the dream isn't necessarily a dream. You live in Los Angeles, which is famous for being known as Plastic City, full-on Plastic City, where, you know, it's all show, it's all presentation. I know it's a cliche, but that's the impression 
that outsiders get of LA and you've obviously experienced elements of that so you're reflecting that in your film how do you want people to respond to it so yeah you're right I mean LA is definitely it's a, it's a definitely superficial city there's a lot of there's a lot of nice down to earth genuine people but there's also a dark sort of materialistic shallow vain side to the city as well and I guess I'd I've seen that over the course of many years so I guess that that experience was reflected in the film regarding what I want the film to do I guess I would say that it's a film that I hope people can see and say you know what like maybe I should try and help people maybe I shouldn't be so apathetic to the struggles in the world and the injustices maybe I'll you know I'll do a little bit you know I'll I'll volunteer here and there or I'll, I'll give a little bit of money away to charity it's not you don't have to dedicate your whole life to altruism but if everyone sort of did a little more I think the world would be a better place so I guess that's kind of where I was coming from as a filmmaker to try and address those themes and why did you I guess select such a heavy film for your first film because you're a young guy you're 30 years old I think you just turned 30 next uh, month yeah next month I'll be so yeah um, um, that's a good question I guess I had been building up some experience with short films for quite a few years and I thought you know as a filmmaker why not try and do something that's uh, even if it is polarizing at least people can see it and say well you know at least I was trying to be original um, so I guess that's why I thought you know even if it even if I go all out on the philosophy and the spiritual connotations at least people can say oh well you know at least he he tried it wasn't generic I guess I was I was trying to avoid a generic film um, so yeah well certainly on that score I don't think you can be faulted because it is uh, a format that you've chosen that you know only a few filmmakers have tackled Andrew I think my dinner with Andre is probably the most famous example of an entire film that consists of a conversation if you, if you want to throw in waiting for Godot uh, and I'm sure there's one or two other examples but there aren't a lot of them you knew going in that that was a tough format to pull off judging from your short film work you obviously know how to move a camera and you know how to direct actors and move in a space in this film you did keep it as a two-hander why did you decide on that format it's a good question yeah I, I had watched my dinner with Andre and I there's a lot more going on camera wise in that film um, I guess it was a, there's a few reasons for that one is budget I mean I didn't have enough money to necessarily shoot that much uh, that many scenes I couldn't and also with the way the way the format is the guys the guy and the girl Sam and Shamita are both sitting you down for the entirety of the film I I guess I just went all out on that sort of, uh, I guess, interview style with, uh, with the cinematography. Um. Okay, because that's probably my main critical note of the film is that while the ideas are engaging, uh, the format is, is, is hard to sit through. I've got to say that I guess when you're watching a piece of cinema it, on whatever medium that... Uh, I guess, you know, one does expect a bit more colour and movement, again, to put it in a very cliched way. So that would be my, my main critical note to you, but you seem to suggest that you knew that the film would divide people, that some people would respond to it, some people maybe not so much. Yeah, I mean, I definitely understand that criticism, and I guess if I had more time and more money I would have even showed flashbacks to what the characters are talking about you know traveling to Africa um, going to these different you know places in the world so I guess definitely budget was the thing but um, yeah I guess that's kind of uh, that was the biggest I guess that's the biggest limitation of an independent filmmaker in general mm. and I think a lot of my peers would attest to that as well um, okay that's fair enough that's fair enough. Um, but I do, I do understand. I do agree. Actually, like I do think it can feel kind of static. You know. 
Now, what has been the life of the film since you finished it? Just tell me a little bit about the roads that it has travelled, the uh, response that it's gotten, and how you respond to the response that it's gotten. So I'm, I'm very grateful, actually, with how it turned out. Overall, I look back at it, and I think it's been it's been quite a success relatively um, it's difficult to break out with films starring unknown actors you know a lot of distributors and festivals uh, you know sometimes looking for higher profile films uh, which is understandable because they have their own you know business models as well um, and they have to you know satisfy their audiences but uh, I guess after I filmed it the I started submitting to as many film festivals as possible uh, I think May 2019, it played at three festivals in the space of two days. So that was like the first uh, first experience the film had actually playing in front of a live audience. Uh, so one was in Orlando, one was at the Hoboken International Film Festival, and the other was at the Los Angeles IFS Film Festival, where it actually won the Best Actress Award. Sharmita won the Best Actress Award. So that was the first uh, time that... Uh, people had seen it and I went I went to the screening on Orlando which was a lot of fun and people for the most part liked the film um, before that I had been sending it to film critics some of them had reviewed my earlier films so I was uh, lucky I got some nice feedback as well um, and uh, yeah since, so since then played at quite a few festivals I think November 2019 uh, it was released by a distributor Indie Rights on quite a few uh, streaming platforms um, and uh, yeah a lot of the feedback's been uh, good some of it's been bad but overall I'm I'm really grateful and happy with the way the film performed and can I ask you frankly have you gotten your uh, return on it financially no we haven't uh, yet unfortunately um, our contracts for three years with the distributor so I'm hoping um, it'll I'll see how it. We'll see how it does. Um, but it is. It is definitely difficult getting money back on a film, uh, at least in the low budget sort of independent world. Okay. And listen, just a, a question to clarify: Was the film intended in any way to be uh, a religious film? Are you a spiritual person? Is there any element of religion in the film that you wanted to express? Um, to be honest, I'm not a religious person uh, per se. I would consider myself relatively spiritual, and I guess the purpose, one of the things I did in the film is that uh, Sharmita, I guess, is sort of an advocate for religion and uh, the belief in God, whereas Sam is in, sorry, Sam, uh, the actor who plays Stephen, is an agnostic atheist. So I guess I wanted to have a discourse between the two of them. Um, so it's not, it's not meant to be either religious nor um, or not anti-religious. I guess it's kind of meant to uh, encourage discussion in okay. the realm. Is it the case that as an independent filmmaker there is a big commercial filmmaker inside wanting to get out? Is that the aim? Yeah, I mean, I think I'd probably say yes and no. You know, I mean, for me, I love making films. It's like a, I feel like it's my calling in life. So I'd love to continue doing it, um, and I would, I would love to direct commercial films. I definitely would, um, and I guess at the same time, I'm grateful of my independent, low budget roots. They've been very fulfilling for me. It's not been an easy ride, um, but I guess I'm grateful that I've been able to make some films. People have seen them. Like, I couldn't really ask for more, you know. But at the same time, I do want to break out. I do want to make more films. I have a script that I'm trying to launch. It's a uh, revenge thriller, a Hollywood-Bollywood crossover film. So that one would be more commercial. There's definitely an artistic side to it as well. Uh, another thing I like to do with independent filmmakers is submit them, Andrew. Submit them to what I've come to call the Shembri Challenge. So, are you ready? Okay. Yeah. In this, in this scenario, I represent a studio suit, some heavy hitter at a major studio who comes to you, says, 
Andrew DeBerg, I've seen your lovely little movie, The Bestowal. I think there are some interesting things in it. I'd like to give you a lot of money in your world. I'm going to give you 10 million bucks. But I want you to remake it with some name actors that we have. And we do want you to open that up a bit. We want you to do some location work. Um, we just want you to make it look much more like a big theatrical cinematic film. Uh, but not interested in seeing those actors in the film. We're going to give you some actors to work with. That's not a negotiable point. Uh, but you can rewrite the film any way you like. But we want the essential film remade with these actors. Andrew DeBerg, what do you say? That would be an absolute dream come true. It would be, uh, it'd be like a, that would be a surreal, amazing thing to happen to me. Um, I'd love to do that. In fact, that's one of the things I'd love to do, actually, is to remake that film with bigger names and more locations and, uh, yeah, a lot more complex, in a more complex way. How is your Santa movie going? Uh, the Santa movie go is going pretty well, thanks. Um, it's a short animated film, so I'm directing and producing that with uh, a couple of other producers. And yeah, animation's definitely a different and uh, amazing medium, so I'm really, I'm enjoying it. Uh, it's quite challenging, um, but uh, it's, yeah, it's been very fun so far. Now, in Australia, filmmakers have a lot of access to government money. There are, and we have government funding bodies for filmmakers, uh, which do an excellent job in providing funds for filmmakers and independent filmmakers can also tap in to this money. It's a, a really wonderful setup that we have for Australian cinema culture. I understand that you don't have that equivalent in the States. Is that the case? Yeah, I don't think there is anything like that. It's amazing that they have that in Australia. and. Uh, is it Screen Australia? I think I've seen quite a few films with that, uh, with that backing on it. Um, when the people at Screen yeah, Australia uh, see this interview and hear you say that, they're going to high five each other. That's great. <laughs> that's a, yeah, that's a great yeah, endorsement. Um, but yeah, just so as an independent filmmaker, you want to raise some money for your film. You don't have access to funding bodies. So what do you do? So, so far I've sort of uh, dealt with private investors, um, which has been challenging. Uh, it's been difficult, but so far it's somewhat worked for me. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's definitely something I'm sort of looking at going forward is how to sort of raise money for this uh, thriller film that I'm trying to do. And uh, it's, quite, it's, quite, uh, it's quite daunting, to be quite honest with you. Um, there's a lot of people that have really liked the script and see a lot of commercial potential, but I think, yeah, raising money seems to be the biggest, I guess if you ask the average independent filmmaker, that's probably the number one thing they'd say on average. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's definitely very difficult. When you have to go to private investors to fund your independent film, are you mindful when you conceive the film, when you make it, when you shoot it, when you cut it, are you mindful of returning that investment to those people? Yeah, I mean, I when I do approach private investors, I do explain to them that the, you know, that filmmaking is a very difficult thing to make money with, and you have to be willing to to accept the fact that, you know, it's not going to work out. Um, so the different levels of people, some of them, uh, some have been family members that sort of said, you know, you know, we've seen you grow up, Andrew, we'd love to support you, whatever you're doing. Um, other people have sort of, they've seen my films and they think, okay, maybe we might get lucky, we might, you know. Um, but they, people that understand and, you know, it's not easy to do that, but uh, it's something you could, I guess you have to do, otherwise you can't make movies, you know. Yeah, I mean, I guess... When I make a film, like I, I put myself in the other position of the finances. I don't want to make a film and, like, I have to, I have to do a hundred percent. I have to give a hundred percent. You know, even after the movie's made, I feel like that's, 
like even more challenging in a way, getting the film out there, getting it to distributors. So I've, I guess I've been working on this now, what's it? yeah, two, two and a half years. Even now I promote the film on Facebook, I still, I mean, my friends have seen hundreds of posts of the film, they're probably sick of it by now. Um, but you just have to, just have to do your best. And uh, I mean, it, for me, like any film I would make, I would, promote it 100 percent. i would try and do everything i can to get it out there and um so yeah now just a quick uh note on some on your short films on two of your short films just one drink and the twisted doll uh, mate you um obviously have this thing about revenge and the ethics of revenge or i guess the ethical justification for revenge what accounts <laughs> <laughs> for this preoccupation <laughs> in these films. Yeah, it's, it's funny you bring that up. Um, I guess I read a lot of philosophy. I think about life. You know, I think, I think revenge is quite a common human emotion if someone feels wronged. And I guess being a fan of a lot of revenge films like Fatal Attraction or The Hand Drops the Cradle or Old Boy, which is a Korean film that I absolutely love, um, so yeah, I, I guess I'm sort of interested by the concept of revenge and the idea that good people can become bad if bad things happen to them. And how does how do experiences actually change human beings? Are we do we stay the same or do we completely change as as people? So yeah, I guess I do sort of I, I do like the ethics side of revenge and uh, discussing that as opposed to you know uh, not exploring that side. And Twisted Doll, I read somewhere, was being developed into a feature film. Is that the case? Yeah, that's the one I, I think I mentioned, uh, the Bollywood Hollywood uh, revenge thriller. So that's actually based on the same story, which is in the short. It's expanded yeah. quite a bit, and the characters have changed, and it kind of feels different. But it, it does still, the script still does pay tribute to the, uh, the short film. Yeah. So yeah, that's the sort of film I'm looking to raise money for, and cast bigger names and sort of make it a bit more commercial. Uh, what do you do for a living? So uh, yeah, I've basically kind of been lucky that this has kind of been my uh, sort of full-time thing for now. I've done different jobs as a production assistant. I've, uh, what I've produced, uh, I produced a, season, a small short season of a cooking show. So I've kind of been, uh, I've kind of been involved uh, pretty heavily with the independent film world and sort of storytelling for a while so hopefully that can continue and you're an actor in a web series called youthful days yeah that was uh, that's something that I enjoy um, I guess I've kind of focused I guess transition more towards filmmaking my first uh, the first time I sort of I think Batman begins was the film that I watched and I thought I wanted to be an actor and you know Acting was something I wanted to do for a while, and I, I've realized that writing and directing is my true calling. Um, if an acting job comes about, I'm not going to reject it, but my main focus is right now is on uh, filmmaking. Can you just tell us where you were born, how you ended up in L.A., and how you got into filmmaking? So I was born in uh, the West Midlands in England. Shrewsbury uh, is the town. And uh, I moved to California when I was 16. Uh, my family moved here. And I went to college in California, sort of stayed stayed around the area, stayed in L.A., Orange County. And uh, sort of, yeah, just sort of, uh, I've always been into films. I did I shot a lot of films when I was in school. I've always been involved in, like, uh, doing skits. And I guess it's been a passion of mine for a while. So I've kind of just uh, transitioned and just try to keep at it. You know? But no film school? No uh, film courses at university? Yeah, I, I did. Uh, I went to a school called Pepperdine in Malibu, and uh, I did quite a lot of film production and film theory classes. I also went to UCLA Extension for a while. I did the producing uh, course there. So I've done quite a few classes in filmmaking, directing, writing, producing, the business side of the industry as well. Um, now, I'm very keen to know, as a 30-year-old filmmaker, what your inspirational film cues are and how far back you go when you 
I'll look at film, how interested you are in films that were made, you know, in the 80s, in the 70s, in the 60s. Can you just tell me a little bit your a little bit about your inspirational movie diet? Ah, uh, it's a good question. I would probably go back even as far as the early 1900s with George Melies. Um, quite a few films that were made before 1950, like uh, Citizen Kane, one of my favourites. The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari uh, is a great German horror film. I think it's regarded as the first horror film ever, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so yeah, I go back. I've, I guess there wouldn't be a single decade, I would say, that I have more favorites from uh, everything. The Shining is one of my favorites, 2001 A Space Odyssey, um, a lot of films from the 80s, 90s, um, 2000s. So yeah, I guess I wouldn't have, but I would say my favorite directors, probably Ira Kurosawa, um, Peter Jackson, uh, Christopher Nolan, Stanley Kubrick. Um, the Korean outer Kim Ji Woon uh, is an amazing uh, director. So I guess I have a very broad array of inspirations. 